I've been with the organization since 2003, and I've been a Debian developer, actually, in my free, as in spare time, um, since 2010. Thanks to Zach for being my account manager <laughs> uh, back then. Um, coincidentally, I started the FSF in 2003. I also first started using Debian in 2003. So the, the two have always been connected for me, even though we have a, uh, some kinds of separation. So I'm here representing the FSF, but um, I am also hoping to do some Debian work. Um, I currently maintain two packages. I contribute very little. I maintain a planner for Emacs, which is a piece of productivity software. And then I maintain uh, another piece of software to destroy your productivity, which is called Xword. That's for doing crossword puzzles. Um, small contributions, but uh, I always love being here and, and being around other people working on the same project, like how so I appreciate the chance to talk about our relationship between the Debian and the FSF um, here today. And I want to start off by saying thank you. Uh, too often, this gets lost um, in discussions about disagreements. But I want to make a point of thanking everybody here for all of the work that you do to deliver free software to users, to promote free software ideals, um, and to make free software better for everybody. Um, and one of the things that we're going to talk about is the FSF endorsing and promoting uh, but even in the absence of that kind of official endorsement or promotion, uh, we need to remember that we have so much in common. And the FSF never criticizes anybody for running Debian main on their computer. That's all free software. Um, the issue is solely about the ways to promote um, and get new people involved in free software while um, steering them away from non-free software to the extent that we can. So. I'm going to move through this somewhat quickly because I want to make sure we have a lot of time for discussion at the end. Uh, we only have 45 minutes, so I'm going to try to talk for about 20 and then um, open it up. And of course, I'll be here all week as well, so I'd really like to meet with anybody for the rest of the week who's interested in talking about the issues I raise or has any other ideas or um, wants to have any other conversations with the FSF. So I think uh, Zach and Bill was they demonstrated the need for us to be talking about this. Um, the free software movement, I think, has been growing. I think there's more free software users than ever before. I think there's more people who have some idea about the issues involved than there ever have been before. But we also have uh, many new kinds of challenges that we have to address and threats, you know, the, uh, the issues of services and mobile computing, or you know, the growing importance of technology and software as an actual medium for uh, protest and activism. You know, there aren't that many especially not doing it for the reasons that we do it. And I think both those talks yesterday to, to open the conference really pointed to the need to revisit um, some of the things that have kept us from working together as, as well as we could. So I want to talk about two broad themes. The one I already mentioned, Debian is an actual FSF endorsed distribution, but also independent of that, uh, things that Debian and the FSF can work together on, um, regardless of whether the first thing is true or not. So, the FSF doesn't have a single uh, official distribution. We have a list of distributions that we think are suitable for recommending to the public um, for the goal of promoting and advancing free software ideals. And we want to remember that uh, this means more than just getting people to use free software and uh, more than convincing them that free software programs run better. It means uh, actually conveying the ideas along with that and growing the movement as a social movement concerned with uh, ethics. So. The two most relevant parts of the criteria that we have for distributions to uphold those values um, are first, a commitment to remove all non-free software, and second, uh, a commitment to not steer users toward non-free software outside of the distribution. So now I'm going to say a few things that are going to maybe sound critical, uh, but I want everybody to know that this all comes from a place of deep respect for what Debian does. Um, I'm a Debian developer, and I'm not interested in standing up and criticizing myself, or disrespecting myself, even at the behalf of my employer. Uh, but I think what we want here is for um, Debian to focus more on the awesome free software work that it does, and possibly less on some other things that have been um, part of it historically. So Debian is the distribution that's the most commonly used distribution that is the closest to meeting the FSF's criteria, and that's because of the huge step that was taken before the release of Squeeze back in 2011 to remove all the non-free firmware from the kernel. And um, because we 
appreciated that and, and recognized um, how difficult that is to do and what a commitment that is, um, we published an announcement um, and did our best to praise Debian for taking that step. And this is an example of the kind of thing I want to talk about later of, this is related to the endorsed distribution issue, but it's also related to the idea of small cooperation on specific issues that we can um, find reasons to uh, promote each other's work. So right now um, a list of the things that we see as problematic for that are true of Debian now um, or seem true of Debian now as it relates to our criteria. And I can't promise that this is comprehensive, uh, but it's indicative. I, I think these, this will cover all the types of issues that would come up. So the biggest one, of course, is, is the relationship of non-free and contrib sections to the project. And Debian has an idea that those things are not part of Debian. And that's stated very clearly in different parts of the project documentation. Uh, but in other parts, the distinction is not so clear. Um, so we can start with the, the wording of the commitment to non-free software, non support for non-free software in the social contract itself. Um, and these are the three spots that's explicit about this that will support people who create or use both free and non-free works on Debian. We will not object to non-free works that are intended to be used on Debian systems. And we acknowledge that some of our users require non-free software, so we will support their use and provide infrastructure for them. Uh, those things, um, supporting is not the same word that we use, which is uh, steering. So the question is, when does supporting non-free software like that become actually steering users toward non-free software? I think uh, one confusing thing about the wording of the social contract is the, the use of the word Debian, actually, because Debian in the social contract sort of refers to both in the same document, the project, and the distribution. And I think that distinction is important when we start looking at this closely because the criteria pertain to the distribution and what uh, a user experiences when they install and run the software, when they visit the home for the software on the web to learn more about it and that sort of thing. Those aren't necessarily the same thing as what other projects the Debian community uh, might be taking on. So supporting and steering are not issues for the first um, criteria, which is actually shipping non-free software. You know, Debian already is meeting that in Maine. There's no dispute about that. So this is really what we have to focus on. Now, this idea of supporting and steering gets a lot of you know, pushback because some people see it as kind of censorship uh, or trying to hide things from users that they'll find inevitably. Um, obviously, anybody can install whatever they want on, an, on a free software system. That's kind of the point. Um, so we have to, uh, but, I, I, but I think that it's not censorship. And we can see this from looking at Debian, which itself has kinds of policies that set limits on how far the project will go to steer users toward non-free software. Contrib exists, you know, uh, seems to exist for largely that reason. If a program, even though it's free, if its only purpose is to install a non-free program, then it doesn't belong in Maine. And that, I think, is a very similar idea to what the FSF is talking about, that if something exists in a distribution to very directly lead users to non-free software, that's not something that uh, fits in a, a distribution we want to promote as an example of the free world. And there's limits on ways that packages in main can refer to packages in contrib or non-free, uh, you know, uh, where those package names can appear in which fields in the control file. So I think what this shows is that you know, broad generalizations about trying to filter what users see um, aren't going to help here. We have to talk about, you know, we're already doing that um, in Debian. And we need to talk about how far uh, those things should go and what the actual concerns are. So I have a list of some of the things that are, uh, where supporting seems to be towards steering Debian um, the packaging fields. So the, the requirements here seem to be a bit inconsistent. Um, you can recommend, you can't recommend uh, packages in non-free, but you can suggest packages in non-free. Um, well, if any user sees this, uh, that's a suggestion to install the non-free program. Um, and we know that technically, well, what that really means is the package manager behaves a certain way if a certain option is activated. Uh, but if this option is, if this information is displayed to a user, suggest means suggest. results that are in both uh, non-free and contrib, um, which sort of, you know, to a user who's learning about Debian for the first time, certainly give the impression that these things are part of Debian. There's text on the page, which does make the point that they are not. But then you do the search, and a list of applications come up, some from uh, non-free, some from contrib, and they're labeled a little bit. 
but um, it gives an impression of, of unification, I think. Um, the installer, while the non-free firmware was removed from the kernel, uh, we, I know that people have been very concerned about the balance of how you maintain that principle of not having a non-free software be present, but still you know, wanting to direct users toward the non-free firmware in order to have specific hardware on their system work. And I know that's a really tricky problem, but I think this is on the list of issues that, that we have to sort out. I think in this case, it has a lot to do with the manner in which it's presented and the message that's delivered. Uh, but you can imagine it sort of defeats the whole purpose if you just you know, really encourage users to go install that software. But what is the right way to let users know that then it won't work on their system because of some components? And how do we actually you know, turn that problem into an opportunity for the free software movement to where we can together apply pressure to get those issues fixed? Um, rather than kind of release that pressure by continuing to um, lead users to the non-free software to make the components work. Documentation um, is an issue in some places. So places like uh, the Debian Wiki have um, everything all together. You know, if you go through the instructions for doing different things, uh, installing the link from software on the front page of the Wiki takes you to a page uh, that lists different things you can install, and Flash and non-free things are listed there right together with everything else. Um, you know, it's a wiki, I could... Uh... Okay, thanks. Uh, you know, it's a wiki, I could have just edited it before the talk. <laughs> um, but I think it's a, a principle to think about um, what's appropriate for official documentation about official Debian. You know, to what extent should that direct users toward uh, non-free applications, especially when things like Flash probably you know, aren't really you know, they're necessary uh, when people want to do certain things, but in the grand scheme of things, is Debian going to try to push the envelope there or uh, just provide the technical instructions? <coughs> um, this is one that, uh, that gets very complicated, but I think is also extremely important. Um, I just made up a name for it today, upstream loopholes. Uh, programs that are in main but install extensions. There's a lot of them. Um, and if those extensions are non-free, is that a problem? And I think sometimes the answer is yes, um, sometimes no. And I think one of the cases where it clearly is a problem is the case where the add-on extension interface is directly is incorporated in the program. And you see this now with IceWeasel. If you click on add-ons, then you get a uh, in the browser. Not you know, it's of course loading over the web, but it looks like part of the browser interface display add-ons that you can choose from. And when I checked this um, earlier today, the very first add-on that appears in the list is one called Evernote Clearly, which is proprietary. And in fact, just you know, not really related, but the license is funny. You are free to use Evernote Clearly with any of the applications or services offered by Mozilla. All the rights are reserved. So that's a, that's a short license to give it credit, but um, that's not free. Worse than that, the uh, list, the application, the add-on does not have, there's no, no indication that it's proprietary in the Ice Weasel window. So I only uh, found... Ice Weasel is not offered by Mozilla. Right. So this is... Yeah, well, if, if you click yes on that, you violate your license. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, you know, oh, what a tangled web we weave um, when you start incorporating little proprietary things. Um, and I'm pretty sure the other two on the top row were also proprietary, but I didn't click through to check it. Uh, so this is a case where I think um, this is you know, essentially violating the principle, in addition to this specific problem, is violating the principle behind Contrib, which is you have a program which is a free program, but is leading to installation of non-free software. And of course, add-ons are an encouraged and suggested part of using the browser. So you know, that's uh, something that I think causes problems for user freedom. So we're working with um, Triscoll, one of the distributions that we endorse, on providing an extension repository for uh, Mozilla-based browsers that lists only the free extensions from the official Mozilla location. There's been some conversation with Mozilla in the past trying to get them to change that. Uh, and if you go to the Mozilla add-on pay library in your browser as, you know, type in the URL, you will, it will show you what the license is. Weirdly, that information is not brought in to the Ice Weasel embedded view or the Firefox embedded view. Also, it's not that helpful because this license was called custom license. So that doesn't really say it's not free. And I think this is an example to close these upstream loopholes. One thing that I would really like to happen um, out of cooperation with Debian is for us to work together 
on fixing these problems upstream. You know, I think that regardless of whether we end up on the same exact page for uh, what constitutes steering and supporting user stored non-free software, this is, you know, Debbie and I think people would largely agree that this problem, it would be better if we didn't have it and if we didn't have to worry about it. And I think that coalitions of us working together can uh, be effective at achieving these things and getting them fixed. Now I know, you know, iSweasel is a web browser, so you can stop the extension library from showing non-free software, but you're not going to stop people from finding non-free software on the web. Um, people could even use Debian to write non-free software. So it's not about uh, blocking all possible access to non-free software. We're not trying to impose restrictions on users. What we're trying to do is draw clear lines about what we enable, what we directly enable, what we directly encourage, steer, and support users to do. And I think you know, this is one example of a way to draw a line, is, is that interface directly embedded in the program. Um, if you had to go to the Mozilla site to install a proprietary add-on, that's a different thing. That's just like going to any other web page. That's an argument we would have with Mozilla, not with Debian. Um, other programs do do better in, in Debian main. LibreOffice, their extension repository, is actually all free software. So this type of thing is possible in widely used popular programs, and it's something that I think we should work together to get changed. So that's kind of the, the quick list um, of types of issues, and I think they all are going to take a lot of thinking um, to go through. Um, we set up a mailing list for this uh, quite a while ago, and I completely my responsibility, my fault for dropping the ball and moving the discussion forward then. Um, but I think it's important that we start it back up again, and we have that mailing list still there for that purpose. Uh, and I want to make clear that we're not just asking Debian to change. I think that I want to engage in this dialogue because I want to see uh, ways the FSF's criteria can be made better as well. And I think that conversation about the issues can lead to that. You know, these aren't, uh, these criteria have been around for a while and we have distributions that are meeting them, but we're always seeking ways to improve them, make them make more sense as a strategy for promoting what we want to promote. And then uh, a few big questions here just to think about. Um, is there any kind of victory condition within Debian uh, for removing non-free software from the social contract. You know, what would be, in what world would you, as a Debian contributor, um, user, think would make non-free software unnecessary? You know, if we, you have a replacement for everything that currently exists non-free, you can repeat the answer. Yeah, um, so I'm gonna, well, answer these questions um, together here. But not free is not very big right now. All right, it's quite small, actually. So what is the point? Uh, and I think that's kind of a thought experiment to see how intrinsic the notion of supporting non-free software is to Debian and Debian's goals. Um, and related to that, you know, does Debian need to support users who have non-free software requirements in the way that it did when the social contract was conceived, given that there are now so many other people happy to take Debian and build non-free stuff on top of it. You know, that wasn't the case uh, back when, when Debian was started. What does it mean for the Debian trademark policy if non-free and contrib are not part of Debian, then is it okay for a company to sell a server with the Debian trademark and the compatibility section when operating that server requires installing software from non-free contrib or third-party package repository with proprietary software. And I think, you know, I, don't, I did read the trademark policy, it doesn't address this question, and I'm not actually recommending a change to it right now, but I think thinking about that, because that's often a point of uh, disjunct having this conversation is what is official Debian, we have our internal definition and we have how it's perceived, and the trademark policy is kind of a definition of what official Debian actually is when you are allowed to use that mark. So I think that can be an interesting way to think about this. Likewise, another kind of thought experiment, how do you support the user who only wants to make one decision once that they only ever want to use free software, right? So the Ice Weasel case is not serving that user well because that Ice Weasel is presenting them with non-free software without telling them um, and giving them the option to install it directly from the program that they got in Debian main. So, we worry a lot about you know, making life difficult for the users who need non-free software, who want non-free software, but let's also worry about the users who want to use only free software and only want to make that decision once and not have to be constantly on the lookout for what uh, programs might be prompting them to install. And how can that decision be made? 
So that's the endorsement section. And this I'm just going to go through quickly because it's a brainstorming list. Um, and I'm hoping this is a lot what we can talk about. These are things that we can do together regardless of that I have thought of um, and would like to discuss regardless of the status of Debian as a distribution that the FSF actively encourages people to install or not. Um, the FSF has, been, uh, has a free software directory which lists our goal is to list all of the free software in the world that runs on a free operating system. Also can run on Windows or Mac, but as long as it runs on a free operating system. Um, a, recently, a couple years ago, we converted the directory to MediaWiki, and we're doing it with Semantic MediaWiki so that we can provide machine-readable information about all of the packages, including licensing information, dependencies, that sort of thing. We've been working on importing packages from Debian main, and we've also been working on uh, mirroring the category system so that the semantic properties in the directory have a relationship to dev tags. So um, you'll see if you visit the directory, you'll see a lot of familiar forms like works with and uses and so on. And uh, <laughs> I know, Amico, yeah. So we would love to see um, cooperation there. Uh, and I think you know this would be an upstream directory essentially. So it wouldn't just be a duplicate of what's already packaged in main, it would be main plus. Um, databases of compatible hardware which is uh, something that I um, have been talking with uh, uh, Lucas and, and Zach about recently. hnode.org is the Free Software Foundation's database of hardware that works with a fully free system. Um, it's volunteer run, but the FSF hosts it and supports it. And this site is different from previous databases of hardware because it's not just about the, the hardware working on a Linux-based system. It's about the hardware working without requiring any non-free firmware or non-free driver. Um, previously, the way that information was contributed to the database, we uh, required users to run one of our endorsed distributions because that was the easiest. Debian resource, but I think Debian could consider pointing to this as a useful resource in order to solve some of the difficulties that users installing the kernel without any non-free firmware in it might be running into right now, especially people that are in the market for buying a new computer. Uh, JavaScript licensing. Um, some of you might have read the material that the FSF have been putting out about this recently. Uh, JavaScript is often distributed somewhere else as free software, but when it is delivered to the user in their browser, it comes without any licensing information. Um, making it, therefore, by default, proprietary. Uh, and we would like, uh, one of the ways to address this could be in the packaging system. You know, we're actually working, trying to work with individual sites right now to add um, license notices, and we have a format for that called JavaScript Web Labels, which is both machine readable and human readable. Um, you can read about that on uh, GNU.org in the JavaScript trap section. Um, I think that's something that Debian could think about doing for packages that contain JavaScript. Um, and whether you know, per file licenses have been sort of optional in the past, but that's because those are programs that are compiled. If you are actually serving JavaScript to a user as an individual thing, then does Debian need to ask that those files have um, license information in them? There's lots of other licensing work we can probably do together. We're both uh, FSF and Debian very concerned with free software licensing. Um, the FSF maintains a couple of staff people whose job it is to help the free software community with licensing issues. I know Debian has plenty of experts with a lot of experience in the Debian context also, but I want to offer that if there, we've worked with Fedora in the past to go over issues with package licensing and we would be more than happy to help um, Debian with that as well if there were any opportunities to do so. Upstream policy changes, like I mentioned, um, in the case of Mozilla, upstream code, uh, what we at the FSF has a high priority projects list where we try to name things which we see as real holes in the world of free software, things that need to get developed or improved. Um, and we're working on revamping that list now. So it would be a very good opportunity for um, Debian users and developers to take a look at that list and uh, send us some feedback about that. Uh, because 
we both have concerns about upstream free software. Debian users want things that aren't packaged because they don't exist. Um, they want to be able to have a, a Skype-like experience that works from their Debian installation. Um, and that's one of the things that's on the priority projects list. So I think there's a lot of potential for cooperation for us to call attention to code that needs to be written, possibly put resources into getting it written. Coordination with GNU. Of course, we, FSF isn't the same thing as GNU, but we uh, do a lot of the organizing work within GNU. And if there are issues that any of you have working with GNU packages upstream, then we might be able to help um, improve channels of communication and make that process work more smoothly. Uh, that's, you know, we talked about this at Libra Planet um, several years ago, and the result of that was that several GNU packages moved to debugs. Um, and there's, you know, I think there was uh, some other email aliases and such that were created so that communication about security issues and other critical problems could move faster between the two, between upstream and packaging. Um, privacy and security, the things that were talked about yesterday, uh, I think that we both have a common interest in protecting free software users, and there's a lot of opportunity there. And then finally, you know, web application packaging. I know it's very difficult, uh, and, but it's kind of key to our future right now. If we are, a lot of the decentralized applications that are being developed, like Media Goblin, um, like Pump.io, are web applications. Um, and they require, uh, we want users to be able to install them easily. And that's what Debian's always been great at, is, is taking free software and making it easy for people to set up. I think that we would like to work, you know, especially in the cases of GNU packages, obviously, but for anything that addresses that need, because that's something that the FSF has been very concerned about as well. So uh, I have lots of goodies in the back there. I saw some people taking them. Um, I brought gifts, so hopefully I wouldn't get lynched. Uh, there are bulletins, uh, stickers, um, things back there that uh, you could help yourself to. And if you want um, anything, we have these like special GNU Linux inside stickers that uh, are heavy-duty foil and will last forever on your laptop. So you can come see me if you're interested in one of those as well. So um, that's where I would like to start the discussion. Um, we'd love to hear. Okay. I will repeat the question or the discussion comment because I'm not going to like try to answer every. My hope is that we can talk together, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you talked about um, web application packaging, and I think that that, that is very important. Um, one of the things that I would like to suggest, which is quite a radical suggestion, is that um, we should come up with some way whereby it's easy when installing a web application to supply the source code to that application's users. Even, for example, if you're using a modified package or a modified module or whatever. Um, so you can look at that as a way of automatically complying with the AGPL, but I would like to look at it as a way of automatically providing with the users with the right freedom as far as we can with respect to that software. Yeah, I, I think, and I, so what you're saying is that we, one issue is AGPL legal compliance, but another issue is just the spirit of the AGPL, which is to supply source code to users whenever possible. I think that's a great idea. So you mentioned the areas in Debian where um, we could possibly improve things in order to improve the um, working together with the SF. One of the things you didn't mention is that we do have somewhat different views on freedom. For example, if I want to use Make on a perfectly free Debian main system and I want to look up their documentation, I won't be able to find it unless I go to non-free. Uh, is there any thought about moving the FSF's position on uh, freedom of documentation as well? Uh, I think that that is something that could be on the table as part of a conversation about um, if we certainly wouldn't let that be the last thing, blocking um, cooperation between us. I think that's uh, something, the issue is in variant sections, right? It's not the GFTL as a whole. So 
Um, I think that that is something that we would discuss. Hi. Um, so uh, this is more of a comment, but first of all, I'm going to start out with something I think is incredibly positive. You, you came up with something that I think is brilliant, important, and I really hope we, as a project, can get behind, which is that a commitment to the idea that, that people should be able to say once, I want a fully free experience, and get it. And I love that as approach, um, because you know, I think that is an important use case. Um, on the other side, I actually don't think it's, I think it's actually a statement that I, I'm in the right place, that, you know, Debian's not on the FSF's um, um, it, the, uh, recommended distributions list, but yet there are other distributions downstream of us that uh, do a lot more supportive and on free. Um, I really think user freedom is something that's very important to me, not choosing for our users and letting our users do what they want even when they disagree with us. And some of our users really want to not care about software freedom. And one of the reasons I'm here is that we, we support that, that I can care a lot about software freedom. We've said in this room we care about software freedom, but we don't have to shove our opinions down our users' throats. And that's very important to me. Um, in fact, sufficiently important that if we were to change our position on that, I wouldn't be here. And I think it's great that Debian can be a moderate community where some people who are very, you know, the FSF is very interested in software freedom. It's not surprising at all. Um, some of our downstream distributions are very interested in user experience. And Debian is a community where we can all get together and make useful forward progress. And I really hope we continue that. Thank you, um, and I, you know, I, I, that's why I, I proposed that way of thinking about it because I think it is, you know, like you said, it's an important flip side. It's a consequence um, of maybe going too far toward uh, supporting just, you know, installing whatever comes along at the expense of people that do want to make that decision. So I think if we went down that path, that could lead to some interesting things, um, and I think we should think about how that could be done um, technically. Uh, and I did. I meant to mention and didn't that. You mentioned the non-free distributions downstream, but it's also uh, the free distributions that we have on the FSF's list wouldn't exist without Debian because they're downstream from Debian. And one positive thing that's happened the last few years is a bit more communication between those distributions and Debian. So Triscoll is one that's on the list, and that's based on Ubuntu, which, of course, um, comes from Debian. And then the other, uh, GNU Sense, which was originally based on Ubuntu, but recently switched to being based directly on Debian. Um, so. You know, that is one thing that's happening, and, and that's why, you know, why I'm a Debian developer and, and contributing to Debian, because those things benefit the free software world, uh, regardless of, of uh, what happens within, you know, Debian proper. It has consequences the work um, spreads out. So I think that's a, another area for cooperation is that derivatives um, downstream distribution work that's happened over the last few years. If I can be sorry, if I, if I can be slightly contentious for a moment, if you go to the FSF's page and look at, you know, so I want to find out, I want to use free software. How can I do this? I go to the FSF page, and all I get is a list of kind of niche distributions. I, by not endorsing Debian, are you actually harming your cause? Because you can't go to the FSF's page and see anything that looks like a mainstream distribution. If you want, a, you know, if I, if I'm interested in free software, I'm not sure if it's something that's maybe for me or not, I go to the FSF's page and there's not, you know, if I see Debian there, I think, oh yeah, I've heard of Debian. That maybe that, you know, there's a problem there that by, by not endorsing Debian, you're, you might be turning users off. Uh, that's, well, that's why we're interested in this, right? Like, uh, I, <laughs> um, we would love to be able to promote a distribution that uh, is as well known as Debian and as widely used as Debian. Um, 
I think that we have made things better in, uh, in the last few years with that list. I think, you know, Triscoll, I'm bummed because I showed up, uh, did a lot of work right before I left to come here to do this presentation from one of the laptops that we recently endorsed, the uh, X60 running uh, Libre Boot, Core Boot with all of the blobs removed. And I had it all ready to go running Triscoll, um, and it has a hardware problem, so I wasn't able to use it. But we run the FSF office on Triscoll. Um, lots of this, most of the servers run Triscoll, and it's a distribution that really does work. Um, and so it's an issue. It's not as recognized, like you say, uh, but uh, we have made strides in improving our ability to advocate actually installing a distribution according to what the FSF wants to promote. But yes, we would love to be able to have um, to bring these forces together. Um, I wonder if one way to what? Uh, I wonder if one way to solve that might be to like even just if we don't endorse Debian, maybe we could put something on the distribution page that said based on Debian. Because if I recall correctly, it, it doesn't say that. So like if we could put just like a logo or anything there, maybe we could get some more recognition and a more balanced presentation. I said I wasn't going to take the mic between every question, and now I am. Um, but yes, uh, and one of the things that's been uh, discussed is, is there another kind of um, relationship, status, recognition that would be appropriate? Um, and something I've been thinking about, you know, that the FSF would describe Debian in a way that's different from the other uh, distributions that we don't endorse because Debian main does contain only free software. So that's something I would love to hear ideas about. I, you know, we haven't been able to come up with anything that, that sounds, you know, positive um, enough on both sides, basically. You know, we don't want to have it be, you want it to be something positive, but we can't say fully positive. And Debian, of course, doesn't want to apply a designation that doesn't sound positive for Debian. So, but I bet there's something there, you know, and I think, I do, um, I think we maybe can add something to the page about that. I mean, it's certainly something that we tell people all the time that those distributions come from Debian. Um, so j just because you asked for um, possible ways of wording it on, on the FSF side, um, uh, I thought of uh, putting more use case related content on that. That is, uh, okay, so those distributions are completely free, but may fit only the use case of very motivated people. Uh, those distributions are free enough that we would suggest them to people willing to make some trade-offs, and these are the trade-offs, and trade-offs in favor of well, dealing with many more use cases. And then if you want, if you have use cases that are not even fit with that, then the, the worst, the least bad options are those. That is, if, if somebody gave you uh, a very proprietary hardware, I mean, a very closed hardware to work with, uh, well, the best thing we can suggest you to do is to use that stuff uh, because, well, it's better than, uh, I don't know, running Windows on it. Um, and so, in a way, uh, that would uh, allow you to endorse more without compromising in freedom because that would be clear. And it may also give you an image of actually caring for work to be done. Uh, because uh, one way that uh, FSF is perceived, at least by many people who are very strong free software advocates, actually, that I know, is something that we we, we started to call the, the Stallman paradox. Uh, I, I have a dear friend uh, who's like one of the biggest free software advocates in Italy that I know, and she uh, has this idea that whenever Stallman uh, points out at the problem, is usually right, and whenever Stallman points at a solution, is usually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for, and I, wouldn't, I don't want the FSF to be perceived that way. Uh, but I think that perception comes from uh, a non wanting to compromise on use cases, which I do appreciate uh, it, uh, for, for as far as a, a general long-term direction is concerned, 
but it's not that useful when you have people that actually have some, some piece of hardware in hand and, and have some problem to solve and they had no choice along the process. Uh, I, I think the idea of, a, of some kind of sort of ranking system is really interesting and could be a good idea. That might be a way to accomplish what I was just describing. Um, you know, what, it's a really complicated question of getting people software that can work on the computer that they already have. Um, and I'm going to suggest that we focus on the question of how do we get all people buying new computers to buy something that works with only Debian main and only free software. Um, I, and that's partly speaking as the as the FSF because other people are going to make compromises to make things work as required now, but there's a risk of confusing those compromises with something that's adequate. And I think we will stand where we are, hopefully, you know, improving the way that we explain those things and come across. Um, but I think the question we can unify on is what can we do to help users that aren't in a, a situation where they can't afford, well, that's a question that's important, but what can we do to help users that are, are going to buy a new computer and help them get the software? Because it's possible, you know, you can run, I, I'm not running any non-free software other than the boot firmware and I have wireless and a webcam and everything else that people, a touch screen, everything else that people want on a laptop, it is possible, it's limited, but if we do a better, options are limited, but if we do a better job together of uh, promoting that and encouraging companies to do that, you know, we might get better results and not have to answer some of these trickier questions for much longer. Uh, to, to extend on that, uh, it just occurred to me, uh, I would love to be able to go to the FSF site and see some documentation on how to use Facebook. Uh, which is, sounds silly, but suppose that I'm a journalist and I have to publish on Facebook, because that's the requirement of the media outlet I work with, then if I could go to the FSF and not be told, you use Facebook, you're wrong, but be told, use Facebook, sucks to be you, this is what you can do to make it not as bad. There's a plugin not to be tracked. Uh, that's how you make a backup of the content you publish so that, that you still own your content somehow. Uh, Skype, whatever, uh, because we have lock-in situations, just denying their existence do not help the people that are locked in, whereas providing ways of being aware when using it actually, I think, provides a benefit and a, a pointer towards a way out, but also a, a benefit, because then using something, being aware of it means not being bitten too much by it and so on. Um, is there is there a concern there for Debian as well um, to address? I mean, that's like uh, when we're looking. I think that's legit. Very, it's feedback for the FSF. But what about you know us working together on questions like that? I'd like to answer Enrico's point, which is historically the FSF have not been. That, let us say that the FSF strengths have not lain in um, that kind of very practical user education. And there are other organizations who have done a much better job of that. And if I wanted to know that kind of information, I would look at the EFF. The EFF have done a, a lot of really good work at um, how to navigate through a world of having to make compromises. Um, and to an extent, I think it's slightly unfair to go to the FSF, who's, and we need the FSF, we need organizations who are very reluctant to compromise. Um, we, we don't want to live in a world where everybody is, is sort of just like muddling through. It's good to have somebody who knows where they stand and stick to it. Uh, how much of the big picture are we missing? Uh, Zach talked yesterday about uh, hordes of developers, young developers not choosing licenses, 
Um, that's significant. We're seeing uh, so much of our computing move away from the, the end device. That's significant. And to see the FSF kind of squabble over blobs, I mean, I understand the, the need to be principled, but it feels like we're missing a big picture. And it also feels like we're not terribly united as uh, free software advocates when we, you know, have such chasms that the FSF can't recommend Debian on its website. It's, there's no uh, unity or fidelity there. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, we need to unify. Um, we need to work together. I think that that's, uh, yeah, I've got this now. So. Thank you. Um, so we uh, we do need to do that, you know, to address the big picture. Um, but I'm going to, you know, say one thing, which is I don't think I think blobs um, are part of the big picture now. So we have hard drive firmware that's being exploited in order to spy on users. Um, having a, a proprietary blob um, running in your ThinkPad that, uh, well, not a proprietary blob, a proprietary system on a chip running in your ThinkPad that can communicate um, over the network without you knowing. You know, these are the types of things that the FSF has, has pushed for always, and it's been hard to persuade people that it's important, but I think these things are part of the big picture now, and I, I think that, it, that Debian should have a, a, well, Debian already did the right thing with the kernel, but I think as it relates to other non-free software and the risks that it is introducing users to um, in those contexts is something you know, that, that should be thought about in light of the things that have happened over the course of the last year and a half. But I agree with the sentiment fully, which is we want to work together in every way that we can and keep the disagreements something that we can, over the long term, try to make progress on without obstructing the broader work that we share in common. Uh, you said you have a laptop that you can run entirely free software on, except the BIOS as the obvious caveat. Um, this one, the other one has a free BIOS. Uh, but at the same time, it's clear that there's probably some firmware embedded in there. Uh, and you sort of, it's, it's clear that there's some firmware embedded in there. Uh, and you mentioned this idea of it's adequate and we could maybe even recommend these systems to people. Um, is that just a sort of a practical distinction because we're so far away from having fully free hardware that you make this practical exception in this case? Or is there some actual difference in ideology that, it, that you honestly believe this is different? Um, some of it is just uh, new stuff has come to light. Um, some of it is learning more about the way components operate and what needs to be adjusted in response to that. Um, some of it is uh, decisions about how we can best push the envelope without not using a computer entirely. You know? um, but we are, you know, every time we find a piece of non-free software and something, we will work to get it out. And that's the same thing that we ask for from our endorsed distributions isn't, you know, stuff gets in there. It happens even with the ones we endorse, but there's a strong commitment to address it and get it out. And so that would be the same thing if we were talking about Debian as an endorsed distribution. Um, it's a huge distribution. Not expecting you to, to get everything out all at once, just to have a commitment that that's the right thing to do. So ideally for hardware. For hardware, the same principle as the, making an so analogy for that. I, I'd like to make a specific response to that question. So it seems to me the question is, why do we make a distinction between the firmware that is chipped in a binary blob that came, originally came with the kernel and now maybe is in some non-free firmware package? Why do we dis differ, distinguish that from the situation where the firmware is an EEPROM on the device? Is that your question? No, it's why do we tolerate non-free software in the device? Why? why why do we tolerate non-free software in the device? Well, there is a power imbalance if somebody can update the software and somebody else can't. If the manufacturer put the firmware in there and they can't update it, then at the very least, we're not any worse off than they are now. Although, obviously, it depends slightly what they programmed it to do to start with. Um, so I think there is a, an ideological difference there. Um, and why do we tolerate firmware, non-free firmware in devices at all? Well, to an extent, um, it's not really practical to do otherwise because the engineering solution for building a complicated system is to put lots of computers in it nowadays. 
Well, I think that's one another area where um, when we're tying this all back to user security and privacy that, that the FSF and Debian could work together is on the question of secure boot um, and what we started calling restricted boot, which is the case where you have a security lock on your computer that you don't have the keys for um, in the UAFI firmware. And Debian, as far as I know, hasn't uh, adopted a method for installing on computers that come um, with secure boot enabled by default. So I would love to be able to participate in the conversation about how that gets approached. You know, we're, the FSF doesn't reject secure boot entirely. We just want it to be under the, the user's control. That's kind of the definition of free software security. Um, and I think we need that. The reason I thought of that was because of the idea that this power relationship, other people have the ability to modify the software on your computer if you have proprietary bits installed. Um, things like secure boot actually hold some potential for protecting users from manipulations like that. So we should think about not only how to get the proprietary stuff out there, but how to work together to improve, to give free software security features that proprietary software doesn't have. So I have a question that'll sound either defeatist or like a troll. So feel free to just tell me you'll answer it offline. You're trusting whoever gave you the microcode update, and that's a, you know, it's a security update. Well, uh, other software companies have distributed security updates that have enforced anti-features on users along with them. So if you can't see it, you can't know what it actually is. So I know we're falling way down the rabbit hole in the, on this topic, but I have one last thing to say. There's actually a continuum here. You've got software at one end that can be updated and is updated daily on the bill. At the far end, you have circuits can, that can do computations. Firmware falls in the middle. Uh, when it comes to freedom, walking down the spectrum is, gets harder. And it, it is up to the end user and to the distribution to decide how far down the spectrum do you go. And if you are out there, the circuit end of computation, all you can say is use this or don't use this because somebody has put an algorithm in there that you don't know and you can't control and you can't modify. And you have none of the freedoms that we are looking for. So it depends on how far the rabbit hole you are going. Just a quick follow-up to that. So we go as far as the stuff we distribute ourselves. We distribute firmware, we distribute software, we do not distribute hardware. Here. 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 So just going back to secure boot or restricted boot, we did have a conversation about this uh, last year. So I came up with a plan of things. Um, I think there was a there was a consensus that so long as the we can, we can support this on architecture where the where the firmware will the system firmware that's already on the system will allow the user to replace the 
trusted keys, that if there were some system uh, that was some some platform that was designed to not support that, that would then then Debian would not participate. So we we can do secure. So basically, we can do secure, but we won't wouldn't do uh, participate in restricted boot. Uh, that, that's yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to have to interrupt here. Uh, there's a video team meeting in 327 for anyone interested in that, and uh, we'll probably be leaving as a result, so you guys can continue on, but uh, it will not be recording. <laughs> yeah, but, so good luck. <laughs> well, thank you. If I can just grab the last word, I wanted to thank you for your work for the FSF, and I wanted to echo some comments that happened earlier saying that we do need someone who stakes out the far end of the spectrum. Um, sorry for calling it fringe. Um, I'm an FSF supporter. I'm very happy that the FSF is there is doing that. And I wanted to say also that your, the recent focus on security and privacy is critical. And I'm very happy to see the FSF doing that. And that the, the trade-off between security and privacy and software freedom is not a trade-off. If the, the challenge that Ashish posed is two pieces of non-free firmware, and you don't know which one of them has a thing that's going to make you more vulnerable. And so the question of which do you do, you're stuck either way. And the FSF has been pushing for a long time for the security and privacy of their users, and it's now explicit. And I really appreciate that, because free software and free firmware and free microcode for your CPU is the only way that we're going to be able to actually protect against the kind of attacks that we're seeing. So thank you for that. Thank you. If anybody is really interested in um, talking more about this, we could.